Hello, everyone. This is Will Harold, the Energy Hunter with Akashic Intelligence, the original AI, coming to you from the Rogue River in Southern Oregon, where I'm meeting with the Secret of Light Group, a Walter Russell book in which we've been studying for almost a year now, uh, dealing with the wave, dealing with what Walter Russell says is that all creation can be found in the wave. And the wave is what we're going to talk about because the wave is created from source into the ether and through polarity, um, solid mass is made. And so the 3D reality is really just a solidification of the wave from source through polarity, which then returns back to source. So as we begin to talk about this, we've already covered quite a bit of the book, but right now we're in chapter three. And I think this is the third video we have on part three. And today we're going to talk about the two opposite electrical conditions. Now, one thing I want to do before we start is that down here at the bottom of this page, I actually put in some color coding legend that we maybe can follow because Walter Russell uses many different terms to talk about the polarity of the wave. And it really depends on the subject that he's discussing on how he would describe and the words he would use to actually um, describe what pole he's talking about in this polarity. As some of you may know, um, his last wife, which was Leo Russell, did not like the idea of positive and negative because Negative is reference to the feminine and or female, and she said, I am not negative. So a lot of it was said that there is charge and discharge versus positive and negative. So uh, you, you can see some of that, but uh, basically we still talk about plus and minus. But the thing that needs to be remembered is that even a negative charge is not absent charge. It's just the opposite charge of a positive charge. Both have charge in opposite and equal direction. The thing that makes them different is their volume. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So let's look at what red is. So red is considered positive or the plus sign. So you, when you look at this diagram here, we see the plus, that is the positive. It is male. It is referred to as father. It is referred to as hot. It is referred to as compression. It is referred to as centripetal. Oftentimes, uh, Walter Russell will call it sky. He'll call it father sky. It's a credit. It's a reaction. It is charging. It is a sphere. And it is matter. The other side of the, of the polarity is blue. So here we see the, the negative. The negative is female. It's mother. It's cold. It's radiation, it's centrifugal, it's earth, it's debit, it's action, it's discharging, it's cube, and it's space. So when we see these highlights on the words that we're speaking here and that we're, that we're reading from, from the book, these words have been highlighted with these either red or blue so that we can keep track of what we're talking about. And whether or not we're talking about compression, positive, or we're talking about negative, um, radiation, and so on and so forth. Then when we talk about green, we're talking about equilibrium. This is the zero point. So within the zero point, it's the point of rest or it's God. So all things, the wave will seek, the positive and negative will seek equilibrium as the wave flows. What has to be thought again is that the wave is following in opposite but equal. But what makes it different, and we're going to talk about that a bit later, is the volume that the polarity is in. So some people have, I think, seen this diagram before. And we've talked about it a little bit. Um, but what this diagram is, is Russell's um, octave. And we've talked a little bit about the octave. That was based on the cubosphere and is actually the eight corners of the cube, right? Is the, is the octaves, and as the wave travels, as you can see, the red would be the negative and the blue the positive, right? 
going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So as a wave travels, there's actually different um, chemicals or I guess solids that are that are made and also gases that are made as it begins to travel, as it gets to the, the higher levels of solidity or mass, as we could say, in the solids and so on. So we start out in these smaller octave waves, in the smaller, and as the wave increases, we actually end up with denser mass, which then will reverse, right, and go back to source from which, so that this will could just be mirrored here, right? And um, it would be blue on this side. If this was flipped, this would be blue, but it would all change over as it returns back. And the thing that needs to be kept in mind is that it's not a linear process. It's not that it is, you know, positive, then negative, positive. They are happening simultaneously. And they are where when we see the wave in that picture we just showed, it's a two-dimensional drawing, which means there's only an X and a Y axis. But in reality, when we go into 3D, we get the the third axis, the Z axis, which then changes it into a toroidal field. And so as this wave moves, it's either centripetal or it's centrifugal, but it is a cone-shaped wave that has one high, one larger size, because that's, when we look at this drawing here, right? We see the larger bit down here, right? And the smaller, so this is a cone shape. When you look at this, this would be a cone, a conical shape. And so when we talk about the wave and wave fields, the wave is really a two-dimensional scenario to where the wave field becomes a three-dimensional. And that's when we get into wave fields in this conical shape. So any questions before I start getting into the study? Any questions on the red, the blue, and the green that I've just talked about? All right. So let me just say one last thing before we move on from this diagram. So at these points here, this would be the, this is the green point. This is the zero point, right? So this is the point of rest, and we it just moves through it. It 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 can't actually get to it. It just at some point it takes and it changes. So within the wave, Walter Russell would call this the crest and this the trough. And so from crest to trough is a wave. So right here is the complete wave. So this is one wave, this is another wave, this is another wave. So that's the way that Walter Russell actually describes waves are from crest to trough. All right. So again, I'm gonna get started into the study, into the discussion. Does anybody have any questions before I get started or comments? Okay, here we go. The two opposite electrical conditions. This zero universe of equilibrium demands two opposed conditions in order to simulate that which our senses interpret for motion and change. These two needed conditions are plus and minus, equilibrium, positive, and negative electricity. Okay, so through the positive and negative, this is what is makes our electricity, just as we have electricity in a battery or other things that we see, they always have a plus and minus pole. Plus zero means credit. That's what we're saying down here. Plus is a credit of pressure borrowed from the universal equilibrium to compress a large volume into a small volume. So this is where we have an expanse of space being compressed down into a planet, into a small volume. Large volume of space being compressed down. Minus zero means an equal expansion to balance the borrowed compression. So as we see this, this is very similar to the yin and the yang, right? We have one side borrowing from the other, but that void from the borrowing is what causes the motion. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit here in the next diagram. So what Walter does here is he actually begins to make an analogy of these two borrowing money. 
So what he says is $1,000 borrowed from a bank is a plus condition, meaning that I now have $1,000 I didn't have of credit. So here we go again, plus and credit, which is balanced by an equal debit. So debit is blue, which is uh, negative, of $1,000. The central zero represents the bank. So if the bank is source, we're borrowing, one side borrows, that really makes a debit on the other side. Both are equal, right? Both are $1,000. It's not that one isn't and one is, it's just they are two separate parts of the equation. A credit, okay, so the, the extended zeros represent credit and debit. Both are equal but opposite. A credit of $1,000 equals zero. When the credit is paid in part or full, the debit is proportionally voided simultaneously with the credit. So what they're saying is, as, as is borrowing, and this is really a borrowing of energy, right? Not of cash, but of energy. So think about it as energy. As this energy is borrowed back and forth, credits and debits are made, but they will always center out to zero at, at some point when, when the debts are paid. But that is at equilibrium, that is at rest, and that's when it returns. So these two opposite conditions of credit and debit, again, positive, negative, correspond to the opposite conditions of compression, right? Compression, positive, father, and expansion, mother, negative, radiation. In nature upon which motion is dependent, when an equilibrium pressure is divided into opposite conditions from the zero from which both are extended. So if we have the zero and both are extended out, motion between the two becomes imperative. They must interchange with each other to void their unbalanced conditions. This is the principle of the electric current. So as these two are voiding each other out and trying to really come back to balance, this is what causes the motion of the electricity in the electric line. He clearly doesn't understand banking, though, the fractional reserve <laughs> system. <laughs> there is no money in the bank when they start. They fucking create it. Yes, that's, this is true. And again, it's an analogy, not a uh, reality. Um, so within this, he actually uses these figures here, which is of two equal um, boxes, basically. So figure 18 represents a room of equal pressure. So two tanks in it are connected with a tube and a pet cock. If people don't know what a pet cock is, here is a pet cock. Yeah. It's really just, a, it's really just, a, just door. It's, it's really just a valve with this thing which opens and closes. Uh -huh. okay. So okay. I put that for Doug especially if I knew he might ask. <laughs> hey, that's good. <laughs> I have my own pet cock. <laughs> I'm sure you do. By pumping all the air out of one tank into the other, the two plus minus conditions have been established, which make motion imperative. So if we pump air out of one, right, it is going to want to go into the other. Nature always horns each opposite for the other in this manner. So as we'd open the valve, right, it would want to move into the other tank because the other tank is void until it becomes a balanced condition with each having their own balance, right? So this, but that motion, right, through the petcock is the motion that we sense and see, all right? That's what we're seeing, that's what we're experiencing with light. So the light is beginning to move and we're seeing the motion in the wave through light, through motion and through solids. It is and what Walter Russell really calls an illusion because it's really just something that's fleeting, it's not real and it's gone once it happens. By opening the pet cock, an outward explosion. Outward explosion is what? An outward explosion is negative, it's cold. Okay, so that's an outward explosion. That's, that is radiation. It will take place in the plus tank. So what we're seeing here, this is kind of back to the analogy of the sun. So in the sun, the sun is hot, as we know, therefore it's positive, but it's exploding inward. As it explodes inwards and makes this heat, 
radiation actually takes place also, and that radiation is what comes out from the sun. So it's radiating out, and then as it gets to the earth, it begins to condense again, right, In, into heat and get cold because the, 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 the expansion is happening. So as it moves through space, it then becomes solid again, and then it begins to radiate back again as it ages. So think about that. Think about that from this plus tank, an inward explosion of equal potential will take place in the evacuated tank. So as, the, <laughs> as it moves out, there's an inward explosion that, that takes place that will begin to, as the tank evaporates, begins to condense what's left. The plus tank will discharge parts of its compressed condition to charge the minus one. The electric battery, battery is the same principle. So what we have is we have this, you know, basical, this movement, right, that's taking place, which is the charge, which is this, this the, which is causing this elect electrical current electrical charge, so within a battery, we have the plus and minus, and we have the negative, equal opposite potentials. And the reason they're equal and opposite potentials is because they are of equal size. If they're not of equal size, then they don't have equal potential. They have equal potential now because they are the same size. Different charge, but same mass. The mass and the volume are the same. The mass is the same. The volume is the same. In nature, the discharge radiation which explodes outward from the sun simultaneously explodes inward as gravitation. Matter, red, hot, positive, and space, mother, cold, negative, constitutes the two conditions necessary for interchange of motion diagrammed in figures 18 and 19. So in these two figures that we talked about earlier with one distinguishing difference. The difference is that the two conditions represented by the tanks of the compressed and expanded air and the two cells electric battery are equal in volume, right? Equal in size, equal in volume. While bodies of matter and their surrounding space are unequal in volume. So what this means, right, when you have Earth and you have our planets and all these other things, we have vast amounts of space compared to the volume of the planet itself. If we were just to do a pi r squared, saying that the Earth is round in a sphere, and we just did a pi r squared to get the volume, you know, um, I guess uh, of that, I guess it would be pi r, that's squared. And we do another equation for our, the cube, uh, for the volume. Um, then, and we did the volume of the space around it, it the volume of the space would be much greater uh, than that of the, the mass of the Earth. So the expanded condition of space is millions of times greater in volume than the compressed condition of its centering body. Does everybody understand what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying when I say that? Well, I think I do, because if it didn't have all that space around it, it wouldn't stay in its position. You know, like where the earth, did, you know, to, you know, with all the other, other things around it. So it's, it's needed as well. Like, you know what I mean? To keep it well, in that. It was in that ratio because of the positive and negative effects with where the centering of that mass is in comparison to the sun. Also. I, I, how is it balanced then? I, I don't understand that. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're going to talk there a little bit as we, ex, as we expand down here. So the expanded condition of space is millions of times greater in volume than the compression and the centering body. This explains the seeming mystery of gravitation and radiation, which caused solid objects to fall toward the Earth and gases to rise toward space. So as we talked about, so if you saw my video that I did, you know, just a short one on the ice and the river and all that, you know, as it cools, right, it begins and there's a compression that's going on as because when you say oh that's cold though it's, it's not gravitation that's radiation you have a simultaneous effect going on it with the cooling that you do have the condensing effect that is opposite and equal that is making that ice to condense 
And at, then at the same time, as it warms, which is the gravitational, you have the uh, radiation of it then turning back into vapor, back, back into water, but it still returns to source, right? So from that solid state, it then returns back to source. So in the electric battery, the interchange between the two pressure conditions can void both in an explosive flash by a short, short circuit if the wire connecting both cells is heavy enough. If a small wire connects both cells, interchange takes place, takes time to complete the voidance. Each condition gives to the other an installment, where the wire is not big enough to void both simultaneously. So what this is saying is, is that this back and forth is not, you know, complete on one side, complete on the other, and back and forth, complete, complete, right? It's in, in its entirety. It's a mutual thing because the exchange medium between the two is not large enough to ex accept that. And therefore, it's a gradual give and take going back and forth. The consequent giving and re-giving by the two opposite pressure constitutes the oscillation of the electric current. So as we're talking about, right, you can see this, this giving and re-giving and so forth and so on is what's causing this current. Electrical interchange by installments is measured and recorded by waves. And the time element of those recordings and ener energies of exchange our wave frequency. So I think this was a uh, question that Brian asked a while ago about what are the frequencies. Well, that's really the rate of interchange between these two items is really the frequencies in which things are happening. They constitute the pulse beat of the electric current. When electric wire pulses with wave frequencies and electric current, we say that is a live wire. So when we have this exchange going back and forth between the positive and negative, that's when we say it's a live current, that that's a live wire. When it stops pulsing because the current is disconnected, we say the wire is dead or it no longer pulses. We're going to get back to this point a little bit at the end of this. So I think this is where we're going to talk a little bit about Doug's question about the difference in mass and the difference in um, how does that work when there's such greater mass. So all nature pulses in a measured frequency with the heartbeat of the universal electric current. So this current is happening throughout all things in our 3D world. That this, this pulse, this condition is happening, and this is what makes things manifest into solids. So it's electric current is evidenced by the universal breathing inward. So a breath inward, we say, is positive, is male, is life toward bodies and outward, which we say is negative, female, radiation, death, toward space. When breathing is switched off in man's body by the cessation of interchange between the two opposite pressure conditions of matter, we say the man is dead. By solving the mystery of installment interchange between bodies and space, one can more fully comprehend the fact that neither pulse beat, breathing, nor wave frequency of interchange have any relation whatsoever to life, for they relate only to the principle by means of which life or energy is manifested by motion. So is there any comments on that so far as what Walter Russell is saying here is that life is not motion. We think that motion is life, but life is greater than motion, correct? Because if we see a robot, it's moving, right? Is it alive? We consider that life? It's moving. Right? We see a car. Is that life? Right? It's moving down the road. Wheels are spinning. Transmission's turning. Pistons are pumping. What Russell's saying here is that we are actually fooled in believing that motion is life, and we're going to cover a little bit about this at the end of this when we, when we discuss a little bit more. But so what he's saying is, is that all these factors that we see in the body that we think constitute life actually constitute motion, and motion is not life. 
where does Russell say that life is? Right? Life is in the knowing. Life is in the conscious. The conscious is not the body. The conscious is outside the body. Consciousness is life. We yeah, I was thinking about those yogis, you know, like when they have complete stillness, they can even float. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to move. Mm -mm. Okay? Or they bring themselves to a certain state and they're still alive if you say, you know, mm -hmm. it's just we, there's no motion. Mm -hmm. Anyway. And, and so I think what Walter Russell is really trying to point out here is, you know, as we define what life is, and this is going to get even deeper, I mean, there's, there's bigger connotations into the idea of scientific materialism as to what is life and what is not life. And so what Walter is trying to say here is that life is not motion. Life is a different proposition than motion. Motion is an illusion of time and the wave as the wave functions through its polarity. So the first step in solving this mystery lies in the principle by means of which matter and space become unequal in volume. Figure 20, which is this one here, represents the electric battery, battery with the line AB dividing the two pressure conditions as the equilibrium. So we're saying AB here. So the, the line up and down, I didn't draw it on that one, I drew on this one. But So the orange line up and down is what he's saying dividing the two pressure conditions as the equilibrium of both. And the reason it's equilibrium, right, is because each side is equal. But this line's drawn in the middle of both sides, so it's an equilibrium. This line represents the, a static equator, a plane of rest. We're saying this right here is the plane of rest. It's perpendicular to CD. And this is representing the static equator. So when you see the orange, that's the static equator of rest, from which both opposite conditions are extended at right angles as a dynamic equator, line CD. So here's line CD from the poles, positive and negative. So within the positive and negative poles, CD, perpendicular is what we call the static equator. Now, I don't like calling this a static equator. That's just me because it's going to move. To me, a static equator <laughs> doesn't move, but maybe there's another reason like static electricity or something that I don't know about. But to me, static is something that is more, more than the dynamic. To me, a dynamic would be something that would be moving, but that's my own description. So, uh, so we talked about the static equator, which is orange, which is up and down. And then the uh, dynamic equator, which is to the poles. So now we actually have a new diagram, which is figure 21. Well, let's go back to this one. So we have this one. Figure 21 represents static, right? Static up and down and dynamic poles or magnetic and electric. So the, this is the magnetic pole. This is the electric pole at 90 degrees from each other. As the two opposed conditions which extend from these planes of rest are equal, the lines of force which connect both are as symmetrical to both diameters as, are, as through reflected by mirrors placed at right angles to each other. Such symmetry belongs to the cube and the sphere alone. So if you guys want to go back to last week where I think we covered the cube sphere quite a bit, and you can um, see what we talked about with the cube, which is, uh, again, the female is the cold and the sphere, which is hot, which is the male. So again, we have this, what we call the poles, the positive and negative. You could actually think about this as the earth with the poles, which is funny because for this diagram, if he's actually using earth, you know, we usually see the poles as, as up and down, uh, you know, yeah. vertical. And uh, this pole is being, and, and this pole is being the one that's horizontal. But in his diagrams, he's drawn it in the opposite direction. So we're seeing this, this, um, this static equator, which is where we actually have, when we talk about planets, where we have the obligation, the obligation, where they become oblique and they begin to spread out, like in Saturn, where you have the rings of Saturn. That's what's taking place in this pole. That's where you're having the equator. You're having 
the thing begin to expand out and actually be, begin to go through a radiation or radial. And these would be the, this would be the north and south poles. As we know, that north is also called father and south is called mother. Um, in positive and negative. So within figure 21, we just talked about this. So again, we have equal and um, equal sides. But now when we get to figure 22, this is interchange between unequal and opposite condition. So when we look at this diagram, this is really more of what we're talking about with the planets in space, where we have this unequal of volume and the polarities differ. So in figure 22 represents the electric body with the negative cell, negative blue cell, much larger, right? The negative cell, so the negative cell is blue. Can somebody mute? I can hear something in the background, like typing or something. With the negative um, cell, much larger than the positive cell. So here's what we're talking about. So if you guys see this little, you know, volume here, is much less than this volume here on the other side. The static equator has moved, right? So as the static equator moves, the volume can change. And as the volume changes, this equator then moves even though the dynamic equator will stay in place. So this begins to be much larger, so this would be say the earth, and this would be the space between it. So the static and dynamic equators will still be at right angles to each other, but the static equator will not be in the middle. It's no longer in the middle, it's gonna move. It will be much nearer the positive pole. So here's the positive pole, it's much nearer to the positive pole, and will be curved because of force, which record the measure of interchange between the two opposite pressures can be symmetrical to the dynamic equators only and not to the static equator. So as we begin to get these curved lines, you know, we actually have these curved lines occurring actually up here too, right? A bit different because this is staying static, but we're seeing the charge as it dissipates out, gets further and further away and begins to form the, 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 the sphere. So this, equator still would, would remain at perpendicular 90 degrees, even though it's truly not a 90 degree, but it's a curved line that is at a 90 degree angle to the dynamic pole, gets closer to the positive, and then this is where we're, this is how this inequity of volume is balanced uh, by the charges as the volume differs. So such symmetry belongs to the radial universe of cone sections. So this is what we were talking about, right? When we talk about these cone sections, when we see these diagrams, such that Walter makes, let me go back here a little ways, where are they? Probably should have brought them closer so we could see them easier. Come on, probably way up, look how far up here they are, okay. So oftentimes when, when, when Walter does his diagrams, you know, he will show these cones, conical sections, right? And he says they're equal too. Well, they're equal because right now that's because, but they're not because see how they have the cone here? If they were, if they were totally equal, then they would be, um, they're equal, but opposite, but not in volume. I mean, this, you could see the same thing if you actually, if, if you had this equator moved over this way, you would see this being a larger mass and this being a smaller mass. But right now he's just showing an, an, he's just showing an equator in the middle. Yeah, I only meant that the, he says the, the open side of the cone and the point he says are equal. That's what I meant. Yeah, I mean the, the, the force, the, you know, the, the, the potential. I guess. I mean, yeah. I know this part where he shows the cone and he says yeah. that the open side and the point are equal. Okay. And so, it, you know, as I was discussing earlier, you know, here's how a planet would look like Saturn with rings around it. So we're seeing the poles, and I don't know why he's 
you know, maybe he thinks that, you know, that this is the way the earth really is, is that it's on its side, not the way we see it, you know, in pictures with this conical, with this, uh, obli with this ring at the other um, static pole. So this would be the static pole and this is the dynamic pole, right? Going through here, right? So at the equator is the dynamic pole. Okay, so figure 23 illustrates this principle from which forms spheres and creates the illusion, the illusion which makes heavy objects seem to be attracted radially toward the earth and tenuous matter thrust radially from it. So what he's saying here is that that's why we see solid objects fall and gaseous objects rise. Okay, so we're seeing red, heat, solid, mass, we see it fall radially toward the earth and then tenuous matter, tenuous matter is gases, thrust radially. So the radiation is pushing them back out. So gases away from it. Line AB shows the curvature of the static equator, which causes the dynamic equator to expand. All this negative end and contract at its positive. So at the positive end, it's contracting. At the negative end, it's expanding. So that's why, so if we were to draw the cone here, right, this would be a cone that we would draw. Can I draw something here? So if we drew the cone, right, you'd have one end with the cone being like this on this end, right? And this end would be a smaller end. And then the cone would be formed like this, right? Can everybody see that? So it's conical in shape. And that might be one reason, as we were talking earlier, why the peer, why the teepee is the best, most efficient for Ibrahim Karim uh, shape to be energy um, giving uh, if you want a dwelling to live in. Doesn't it go to a point though? You're saying it's not a point at the small end. Well, it will eventually go to a point. Yeah, I just didn't draw it. Right. But yeah, so it will go to a point. Um, pressure would occur. Okay, so. The curve is static, which causes dynamic to expand its negative end and contract at the end of the radii of the cone. The outward thrust of radiative pressure, so outward thrust, right again, female, negative, outward thrust, would curve the base of the cone, thus produced to correspond with the curvature of its static equator. So that's why we get this kind of curving line down. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about this now. Figure. 24 represents a bar magnet. So anybody knows a bar magnet, it's just a bar of steel that has a positive and negative charge. And a, what, we, what do we call this now? This is the dynamic, this is the static equator here in the center, represents a, which has been divided into two opposite pressure conditions of this electric universe by coiling a charged wire around the bar of steel, thus forming two opposed plus and minus electrical vortices with entities intensities measured at pole so right here we have positive and negative we have the magnet we have the static equator and we have the dynamic equator and when we look at the circle we're seeing these inward forces which are gravitational red hot male and these exterior explosions from out, from inward out, which are radiative, cold, female, negative. So Walter gets into a little bit more discussion. Again, now we see, now do we see the cone now that we talked about earlier, right? Two nails of equal weight are suspended to the poles. So here's a nail here. There's another nail over here, which is, I think, actually better kind of shown in this diagram here. Two nails, right, at each of the poles. It is not magnetism, however, that picks up these nails. It is the electric vortices which pick them up. For the vortices are still effective upon the steel bar, even though the electrically charged wire has been removed. So now 
the bar has what we call been magnetized, but what Walter Russell saying, it's not magnetism, it's the electrical effect. It is the whirlpool motion of the electric vortex. Now the whirlpool motion, we also call this, right, the centripetal or the centrifugal, or we also call it, you know, uh, the toroidal field, right? We got the names we have for this, this whirlpool motion of electric vortex, which forms the work of lifting those nails and not the stillness of the poles of magnetic light. If the bar magnet is enlarged at one end, it becomes a cone. So now we have the bar magnet being extended at one end. The division into two opposed conditions will still be equal. So what we're saying is we're just expanding that, but it's still equal uh, of the two. The length is still the same, but the volume will be so large in one as compared to the other that the nail, which the positive end, so the nail on the positive end where it's still small, will still pick up, cannot be lifted by the negative end, okay, because we've dispersed the volume, so this side cannot pick up that volume, correct? Because it's, so how do you get the volume to be picked up? Unless the nail is ground to a fine powder, so then the volume is reduced into small granulars, will then lift the same weight in total, but only by dividing the nail over the whole volume. So as you see, it, not all the granulars are like, you know, in a line, right? They're, they're not like forming a nail. They are spread across the volume, the surface of the cone. There, is everybody following what I'm talking about here? Any questions at this point? Okay, so, so where this is leading to is this is solid, right? As we begin to grind things fine, this is gaseous, right? This is where as we get, as we develop and disperse through the negative or the radiation, right? The body has to get less dense in order to have the same effect of being picked up or being moved within the motion. So. The denser the body, the less dense. Still the same volume, but spread over a greater distance. Right, the nail, the volume of the nail has not changed. Its, vo it, its volume is still the same, but it's spread. So its volume is actually increased uh, because there's more space between the, the um, filing. Okay, so, um, that's fixed. Before the, this principle is applied to matter and space, it is necessary to correct the general impression that the Earth is a magnet. By referring, by referring to the bar magnet pictured in 24, it can be seen that the poles along, alone express gravity. The Earth, on the contrary, expresses gravity at its center. So as we have this, uh, we call gravitational, as we have this condensing, as we have this heat, it comes into the center point. Once it comes to the center point, it begins to reflect back out in radiation, in expansive, in negative. The Earth is formed between magnetic gaps, magnetic gaps of its wave bodies as alt bodies are formed, as in figure 27 here. We have this thing, so this is how the Earth is being formed into a sphere, okay, per Walter Russell. So you have the negative, you have the positive, you have the static equator and the dynamic equator, and all these are working together to form this sphere shape. The Earth is formed between magnetic gas. We talked about this. Uh, that still, uh, if two bar magnets are placed so the negative and positive ends are near each other, that still point, which we call the center of gravity, will evidence itself between the two ends. If iron filings are placed in this gap, conditions of gravity, similar to those of the Earth, will be found there. So we can simulate gravity by taking two bar magnets, opposite ends with the positive and negative, and we'll see the iron filings actually being drawn. So gravity will end and radiation will begin at the center. Nails will fall toward it from any direction, as heavy objects do on Earth, and compass needles will follow the board. Vortical directions of lines of force 
which extend toward its pole. So matter is formed between opposite poles in waves. So as we see the positive and the negative, this inward pressure is beginning to form as also the expansion is taking place. The analogy between the unequal battery cells and bar magnets is now sufficiently complete to compare them with matter and space. In figure 28, two bar magnets have been fanned out into cones. So here we see these two magnets, right? These, are the, these, these little pie pieces are the cones that we're talking about and both sides being negative, this side being positive, and so on. So um, the weight which the positive end will pick up as a solid has to be finely divided in order for the expanded volume of the negative end to pick it up. So we have to have this, the matter of this has to be actually expanded or increased in order for it to be picked up by the negative pole. The essential difference between the two opposed pressure conditions of the electric battery and of the two of matter and space is that the battery, the opposed potentials are equal because the volumes are equal. So now we're just getting back to the same thing that the battery is divided into two equal halves. Um, in space, planets and space are not equal. They share different volumes. Any questions about where Walter's going or what we're talking about here? <laughs> uh, any questions at all at this point? I'm thinking uh, in the morning, you know, I see the gases, uh, the steam coming. Well, I'll call it steam. It's winter right now, but I see it coming out of of the river here mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know? that's the radiation, right? Of, yeah, like, you know, has to, yeah. has to, well, has it, well, it's also expanding in volume, if you mm -hmm. say that. You said exactly. about the gases. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, because, I mean, if you, sh he shows the, well, later on, we're going to see in some, well, it's very compressed inside, mm -hmm. and then it has to expand out. Yeah. Well, because yeah. even, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it's also from that book. Um, um, I'm thinking that cosmic pulse of life mm -hmm. i'm thinking um being that the guy who wrote this or william wright mm -hmm. that it's that if we thought of the earth as a biological mm -hmm. entity mm -hmm. we would understand why there's all these processes like gases and you know what i mean yeah well and, anyway yeah and and really that is where a lot of I would say, you know, Steiner and these different people, even Russell, not, I mean, Russell really didn't talk about the, the, the life of, of the planet. This is much more of a Sheldrake type idea also, Rupert Sheldrake. But once, but there are people who are saying that, that this is where we need to go as a civilization, as a culture, to actually see the earth as being alive. And this will be the new science spiritual science that uh, will lift us into, you know, our next age. And once we can, and again, the, you know, the native people saw it, but they actually saw it spiritually. They didn't see it scientifically. And so we are actually moving a little bit out of just pure shamanism of the earth, you know, and seeing the earth and understanding the father, guy and mother earth concept, but actually to understand the principles of how they were. And maybe actually aiding once we understand them ourselves. We have to get out of materialism. Correct. Well, mm -hmm. yes. And because scientific materialism is really just trying to make up science, as Walter Russell says. We're seeing, mo we're seeing motion as life, and that's not life, right? So, uh, so as we look at this diagram here, figure 28, with the two. But I. I Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I didn't want to interrupt anyone else too. But it seems like, you know, motion is what's really cool about this is like going off what Doug just said. It's like scientific materialism is inverted. So, like, whereas it's meaningless mm -hmm. because it's all about motion, right? Correct. And the spiritual truth is now, like, well, not now, it's always been this case, but um, it just, 
it, was, it got me excited when you said um, motion is an illusion. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, um, so as we, the essential difference between the two opposed pressure conditions of the electric battery, we've already talked about this, that when you have two equals, right, it's just equal but opposite. But when they, when that dynamic, when the static equator changes, you can then have differences in volumes. And, and that's, we're going to talk a little bit about potential. So when the universal battery of matter, right, which we, is red, positive, father, base, blue, negative, female, the two opposed conditions are conspicuous, conspicuously unequal. The resultant high and low potential contrast each other so violently that solid matter falling toward the high potential of the compressed condition must be, be divided into vapors and gases before the same substance will fall toward the low potential of the expanded condition. So what this is saying, right, is that where we have the the condensed matter, we have high potential. As it dissipates and goes into space, that that potential is what we'd call low potential. Because it's more dispersed, right? So the more dispersed, the lower the potential. The more condensed, the higher the potential. So now we're using terms as potential, high potential, low potential for um, for for space and for matter. So low potential is space and high potential is matter. A solid bar of iron will fall radially toward the earth because both are high potential compressed science. Solids, high potential compressed solids. If divided sufficiently by vaporizing, right, that same bar of iron will fall radially toward the heavens will be this outward explosion, right? This is what we talked about with the vapor, the dew. So as um, Giselle was talking about the river, you know, my river out here in front of my house is probably about five, maybe, you know, four to five feet deep. But that vapor can be eight or, or you know, 10 feet, right? Or all the way to the heavens. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not the whole river, right? Because even though it's the same distance, you know, that first four feet is not the whole, it's not like the river is gone. It's just been expanded. So it's just an expansion of that mass as it goes up. It still, the volumes will be different, but it will be based upon what their uh, potential is, whether high or low. So gravity and radiativity are opposite pressure conditions of the same thing. Both of those pressure conditions are in every creating thing. Every creating thing can expand, right, expand, female, negative, to lower its potential, or can contract to raise it. Like conditions seek like conditions to find balance. Creating things change their compressed conditions to expanded conditions, must smooth to find balance in like conditions. That is the sole cause of two-way motion. So as things begin to go from high potential to low potential, from radiation to gravitation within this, this is what we call the wave. As we will look, remember back to that diagram I showed, how we get the conical figure, how we get the different high and low potentials. So every potential has a balancing potential position somewhere in the universe. I think this is what Doug has often talked about, about the black hole and the suns and so on. It's this. Every potential has a balancing potential position somewhere in the universe. Desire to find that position is in every creating thing, and any restraint exerted for, to prevent it from moving to find its balancing potential can be measured as weight. So, mm -hmm. so that's what weight is, is, is a constraint from it trying to find its balancing potential. The cause of the radial universe, which constitutes matter, again, red, positive, and space, cold, negative, lies in the inequality of its two opposite pressure conditions, both as to volume, which we talked about, right, and potential. When we talk about potential, again, 
high potential, red, male, condensed, low potential, female, negative, base. Now, again, I'm not saying that female has low potential, meaning that women have a lower potential than the red. That, this is just what Walter says as descriptive words about, not about sexes or the races or anything like that. So, I've got a question. Okay, okay go ahead. Um, earlier, you had fall or falling in quotes. Yes. And it made me wonder if somehow this is related to how they built the pyramids. It could be. I mean, this, the idea that through polarities and through exchange of energies that we can actually move things, right? And how they fall. Um, th this, as I say, as we move, I, I believe, you know, my personal belief is, is that this is knowledge that has been lost. Right. And, sure. or, you know, or, or hidden or whatever, occulted or whatever you might want to say. Okay. So, Definitely. Yes. So, so, um, so I believe that as we begin to unlock some of these ideas and actually really, I mean, because look how long we've been studying this. I mean, it takes a long time to actually understand some of this, right? And this takes a, a lot of, of digestion of this material. And it takes, you know, also looking at nature, right? And we're actually seeing how things work and beginning, um, to actually bring that into our consciousness. So, um, yes. Yeah, didn't they also use sound? So they used magnetics along with sound, right? Correct. I, I, well, they used the octave, right? I mean, just, again, there is no difference between sound, uh, gases, right? I mean, these are all just different. Um, Vibrations. Yeah, different conditions within the waveform, right? Mm -hmm. Different and, octaves, different expressions yeah. in the different levels of the octaves correct and that's why I like bear will talk about that you know one day we may be may be able to once we actually understand the wave patterns that we can actually create just through pure wave or mechanics without having to actually put things together that we can actually create those through intent with waveform so we'll see that's a great that, that's a you know a great goal to try to achieve so the cause of radial universe, which constitutes matter and space, lies in the inequality of its two opposite pressure conditions, both as two volumes of potential. The cause of the universal pulse the, and the breathing which motivates the manifestation of life in every creating thing lies also in this inequality. All creating things pulse and breathe, just as organic life pulses and breathes. But this is not life, it is but motion. So I kind of threw this cartoon up here. I don't know, you know, if anybody remembers, you know, uh, Frankenstein, which is, I think her name was Sheely. She? Uh, I, forget, I can't think of it now. But if anybody remembers the old Frankenstein movies, it, there was also movies called The Reanimator and Animators, where you're actually animating flesh. And by animating flesh, what you're doing is you're putting electrical charge into it and animating a organic mass and as this guy yells out here right it's alive it's alive it's not alive it's just motion and i put this down here this is what scientific materialism is the concept that animated matter is alive and, uh, we're, in, we're, the, in the early science classes we would put a uh, electrical pulse to a frog leg and watch it watch it move right and that's just animation it's not alive not alive it was clear it's just it's just movement right motion yeah. and i don't know if you guys remembered but you know it was said that the jewish rabbis could take um you know clay or any substance and make what they would call a golem we talked a little bit about the golem and i think in the spiritual um, sovereignty series where the, you can make these things right you can make animated matter but it's not alive it's just motion and as we move forward into some of the things that we're doing today where we, have, well we, we we may have to begin to discern whether or not we are becoming animated matter versus alive. 
because as we change our bodies, as we change, you know, the idea that we're going to take our essence and put it into a machine because the machine has motion, is it alive? Who's doing that? There's a lot of people who are talking about putting it's what the shop is all about. Yep. Well, in the metaverse, and when yep. we're talking about this, yes. um, not life, like that's exactly what these agregors are, agregors are is these fourth dimensional thought forms. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you're describing is this fourth dimensional um, reality where things, things can appear real, but they're actually lifeless um, projections of that's where I'm running out of words. <laughs> well, we're, that, that's actually where our world is, though, too. Our bodies are really lifeless projections of us. They're just you mean like a president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Biden, exactly. <laughs> well, again, <laughs> yeah, we can all make our, we can all draw our own analogies and conclusions uh, to the physical space. But uh, what Walter Russell wants us to know is that this is an illusion, also, just as you were talking about, Grant. With the metaverse it we are greater divine beings that stand outside of our physical existence and the mm -hmm. animation that we feel is not our life it is an illusion very scary the metaverse thing mm -hmm. so hopefully everybody do we need more questions or anything before we we uh, close out here okay so uh, what's going to be happening here is, you know, we're going to continue um, studying uh, Walter Russell until we get at least through this part three, but I probably will also be doing some separate um, pods, some separate uh, YouTube videos on um, the things that we talked about, which is the land patents process through um, Ron mm -hmm. Gibson for the Eagle Medicine Ranch property that I just built. And we'll also be talking a little bit about, oh, um, how I'm using the wave and different um, applications on that property, both within biogeometry, Oregon, and some Russell principles in how I'm going to set that property up. So those will be, um, I, I do have a link on the Acacia Intelligence site to the Eagle Medicine Ranch site. And uh -huh. so, um, if you want to just, it's on this. When you, you bring up the Acacia Intelligence site, um, it will, it's the first, um, uh, I think it says My Inspirations, is, it shows up there. So, uh, you guys can be checking those out also. So, again, this is Will Harold, the energy hunter with Acacia Intelligence, the original AI from the Rogue River with the Secret of Light group. Thank you all so much. Remember, please like and subscribe. And with that, we will stop the recording.